hot up here, so to distinguish myself from the previous speaker, uh, I will remove my... Okay, so I, I um, as Manu said, I, 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 I don't have anything direct to do with this paper except that I served on the PhD committee of the second author, whose PhD was on a different subject, uh, and I was in Hong Kong at the time that the authors were being, uh, were, were having trouble getting visas from the U.S. consulate in Hong Kong, and they turned to me and said, "Our paper is just after yours. Can't could you give our paper for us?" So, uh, it's maybe a question of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. But uh, <laughs> I, I had already, I, I liked the paper very much. I had actually gotten a preprint of it from them and uh, covered it in my graduate uh, compiler class. So I already knew the results uh, at, at some level, uh, and it allowed me to review it again and uh, work with them on, on some of the slides. So I'll, um, uh, I'll do my best. So I may not do so well in the question uh, part, though. So anyway, this paper, unlike the previous paper, this concerns dynamic analysis. Specifically, it's about an efficient method for collecting a call trace for a program. So, for them, a call trace, and for all of us, I think, a call trace is the sequence of function calls and returns in a given uh, execution of the program. So the, we, we want to get the uh, entire temporal execution order, and we want to have uh, uh, it, we want to have this trace that shows the, the, the calling and return sequences. So I'm not going to go through uh, this. There are just many applications of call traces in uh, uh, in software engineering and program analysis. OK, so current practice is kind of brute force. You, uh, you implement every call site and return site. Uh, and the problem here is that that costs a lot in time and space. So what the authors report is something like a 16-fold slowdown on, uh, on at least one benchmark uh, if you do this. And the size of the call trace log can grow to you know, by 50 gigabytes an hour on, on, a, on a production run. So their key insight is that instead of the conventional way of doing it, they're going, to they're going to have a sparser set of instrumentation sites that execute the program and collect what that set of instrumentation sites uh, produce. And then they'll have an offline inference process that will recover the exact call trace out of the partial call trace. OK? So it's sort of like an uh, information recovery process. So let's, um, let's look to see how how this might work. So down here, we're going to uh, show the log call trace. So that's the one from the instrumentation that's actually in the program. And then the inferred full call trace uh, that, that they would get in the post-processing step. And so here, they start with a, a compression of the control flow graph of the, of the program onto just the call sites and the return sites. And let's suppose that none of the things in procedure main here uh, are, are instrumented. So what will happen is that we'll go off at this call site to what's being called there, procedure A in this case. And so we want the, and then we're going to come back. So we want the inferred call trace by the time we've gotten back here to have both C1 and, uh, and R2. Then we'll follow one of these branches. Suppose we go down here and call B. And now uh, we get to, uh, let's suppose that we get to a place where we actually are having instrumentation code. Uh, if we go down this branch, we'll get the C5 showing up in the log call trace. If we go down this branch, we'll get the C6. And uh, by the time, uh, uh, w what we want is a method that will take this log call trace and figure out that it has to put, in the first case, C1, R2, and C2 back into the trace before C5. And in the case of the second one, it will put back C1, R2, C2. Okay. Or if it had gone down this way and we had a sort of similar situation, it would put back C1, R2, C3 uh, in, in, in these two situations. So how are they going to do that? So the idea is to just have a static set of instrumentation sites. We'll call that capital I. Uh, log those. Do the full trace. And one thing that we need is that the logged call trace, better, it better be deterministic. There better be a unique full call trace that we get out of a logged call trace, right? Otherwise, there's ambiguity, and who knows, you know, how, how would we know how to restore things? We don't want a, a most likely uh, restoration. We want an exact restoration. So the core idea is 
based on the observation that, every, that you can arrange so that every string in the language of the full call traces can be parsed by an LL1 grammar G. Okay? So I guess that's the theme of this session, right? In the last, I mean, I've been working using context-free models of uh, abstract models of programs for a long time. And mostly, we don't really examine the structure of those grammars. The grammars are out there, and we just use them. And uh, in the previous paper, it was, uh, you know, do something because it was an LCFL and do something designed for that. Here, uh, the, the key thing is to make use of, of the fact that you can create an LL1 grammar, okay? And then, we're going to use a sparser language as the instrumentation language that can also be parsed by an LL1 grammar. We'll call that G prime. And not only that, G and G prime are going to be so close that every time we use a G prime production, we'll, there, there'll be a corresponding G production. So what that means is that if we parse the log call trace by the G prime grammar, we can go back to the parse tree for the G prime uh, grammar, replace it with the G productions, and then that'll bring in all the, all the missing symbols. Okay, it's been a very nice idea. We take the G prime parse tree, convert it to a G parse tree, and do the recovery that way. Okay, so what do we need to do? So the way they break it down is that, uh, that uh, there, there are going to be a sequence of productions that start with calls to, uh, uh, that, that have a symbol that represents some call site. Then the next part of the call trace that you want is the call trace for the called procedure. So this is going to be a non-terminal that represents the call trace that you get from that blue blob. Then you're going to come back, and we need a non-terminal that represents whatever it is that happens in the procedure afterwards. Okay. So here uh, we would have we would say that the the production for func main, since we're, we're dealing with the main procedure, but for any procedure it would be have the same kind of structure, is going to be C1 func A because A is called at C1 and then followed by the non-terminal for successor of C1 because we're dealing with call site C1. Okay? And we fill these out for the other ones and we get, we get productions like that. Okay, so is it an L1 grammar? Well, remember what an L1 grammar is. There are two, there, there are two properties that if you have a non-terminal that has two choices, two or more choices, but for each pair of choices, you better have uh, a non-empty, uh, an empty intersection of the first sets for the, for the right-hand sides, okay? And the second thing is that if either of these is nullable, so without loss of generality, if A alpha is nullable, meaning that epsilon is in the, is in the first set, then it better be the case that the follow set of the left-hand side non-terminal intersect the first set of the remaining uh, right-hand side is empty, okay? And uh, in this case, it's trivial because every for the full call trace, the original call trace that we're dealing with, what we call grammar G, every production starts with a different terminal symbol uh, CI, so uh, there, there are no epsilons in the first sets and uh, there, are no, there are no conflicts in, in the first sets, okay? So no conflicts there, no, no, uh, no problems there. So we have an LL1 grammar, so that, that's good. Okay, so now we want to do the, the logged call trace with productions, and, uh, and the idea here is pretty simple. We're going to take productions, and if we have a symbol that's not in our set, we're just going to drop it. So in this case, C3 and C5 are the, are the symbols in, the set of, in, in, in set I. Here we had these three productions, so we're left with the C3 symbol here, and and nothing at, at to, start, to start these things off. Of course, now we have, because we've removed symbols, we no, no longer have the protecting symbol that made our grammar LL1, and so we've got to re-examine that whole question about, about whether we have an LL1 grammar. And in general, we don't have a, an LL1 grammar. But we do have this property that uh, we can map back because uh, you know, anytime we use this production, we're gonna use this production, and if our call trace here had something with a C5 in it, the fact that we replace it with something that has the C1, uh, with a, we replace the production in the parse tree with, that used this production with an occurrence of this production over here with the symbol C1, that's why that pops back into the call trace, into the, into the full call trace. Okay? So primed things on the left, unprimed uh, symbols on the right. Okay, so now we come to the problem of uh, we want to restrict the call trace model G prime to be an L1 grammar. And we just have to have a sufficient condition for that, okay? So, uh, so, so we, what, what we want is every time we want, have a alternatives for a, for a non-terminal, we want the intersections of the first sets to be empty. That's the same as usual. 
And here we just want to arrange it so that they never have epsilon, no, that no right-hand sides are nullable. Okay? So it's just a simple way of, of addressing that. So it's a sufficient condition so that we get our, our deterministic uh, predictive parser. So it turns out they show in the paper that, uh, that uh, it, uh, more complicated strategies for, ch for, for, for choosing a way of making the grammar be LO1, that's a hard problem. They have some NP hardness results. So what they do is they build a graph that tells them when they have these conflicts that, uh, that show that the grammar is not LL1. They compute a vertex cover of the graph. They're actually doing this sort of doing this on the fly. And the point is that the, um, uh, the, they're going to instrument this, the call sites that are selected by the vertex cover. And in fact, they're going to do it so when they're done, the, the, they will be adding things into the set I on the fly as they compute the vertex cover, removing edges from the, from the conflict graph. Once they get an empty conflict graph or empty edges, no edges in the conflict graph, then they know they have no conflicts, they've got an L1 grammar, and they're all set. So assume for the moment that the call graph of the input program is acyclic, and for each call site, uh, the corresponding right-hand side uh, is, is not nullable, all right? There's an easy way of getting to this stage, which I'll, I'll mention in a second. So the call site conflict graph is an undirected graph. The vertices are, uh, represent the call sites, and the edges are, uh, are indicating a violation of the L01 grammar condition. And basically, it's the non-empty intersection of the, of the first sets for the right-hand sides that correspond to these call sites. Okay? So this is that if we had uh, uh, a conflict graph that had no edges, then we would have instrumentation that would that would, that would uh, have the desired property of, of giving us an L01 grammar. Okay, so, it's, so, uh, so the idea is pretty simple. Uh, so so here, here, is our, here is our example. We just have this one conflict in the graph, and uh, uh, sort of in, in general, what we're gonna be doing is uh, disc, you know, selecting an edge, picking, uh, picking one of these to be in our instrumentation set, and then that allows us to remove the edge and because it's, it's getting rid of this uh, conflict in the first sets. Okay, but now we have made this strong uh, assumption that we had this acyclic graph and, and no first sets, but uh, no, F, no nullable uh, uh, right-hand sides. But that we can just fix up, e or they fix up easily by, um, by adding things, adding call sites into the instrumentation set for the call sites that can introduce cycles into the call graph. And then they also do the, the, a similar thing for places where they have nullable, nullable right-hand sides. Okay, so uh, once, they've got, once they've taken that step, then they've got the call graph, they, they work on that, put in all the uh, several other um, things, and then they have a cleanup step that removes some, uh, that, that allows them to take out a, a few of those. Okay. So there are more details in the paper. There's, there, there are some hardness results. They also, uh, because they're dealing with the Java programs, they have some dynamic features that they have to, uh, that they have to handle. I'll refer you to the paper. Their evaluation was on the DeCapo benchmark suite. Uh, so these are fairly substantial in terms of the number of call sites and returns. They were running on the DeCapo inputs, so they're actually not very long runs, a few seconds to tens of seconds. Uh, and what they evaluated was their algorithm, the brute force one, and then one that just in instruments branch points in the, uh, in the, in the uh, compressed uh, control flow graph. So that's what they call BRI. And their evaluation metrics are the number of instrumentation sites, the runtime overhead, and the space. So, uh, uh, so here is the, um, sorry, here is their method, and you can see they're winning. Uh, so this is, this is with respect to the, the, the brute force method. They're getting a 66% reduction in the number of instrumentation sites, so that's pretty substantial. In terms of runtime overhead, the, the naive method is uh, 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 over 200% overhead. If you instrument just the branch sites uh, in, the, uh, in the compressed call graph, you're down to 128%, and their overhead is 68%. Okay? It, doesn't look so dramatic here because this is a log scale across the, across the bottom. Okay, and in terms of space overhead, they're getting 64% uh, uh, compression. 
Okay? So to wrap up, their, their idea is work with a sparser language, sparser set of instrumentation sites, do an offline process to infer uh, placement of the correct symbols back into the call trace. Their trick is, or their observation is based on, on, on using the properties of L1 grammars. They have these corresponding grammars. Their problem is, uh, how do they make the second grammar LL1? They have some heuristics in order to make it LL1 to make the whole thing work. And then they incorporated it into their tool, Casper, and showed that they get uh, lower runtime and space overheads than the competing techniques. Okay, with that, let me stop and take questions. You can ask me. Um, so it seems like, you know, at least for a language like Java, that there are different you know, techniques for computing call graphs with varying levels of precision. I don't know if they got into any of the, the trade offs involved. I mean, I guess if you assume that your program is going to run for a long enough time, then you would just build as precise a call graph as you can to reduce the number of instrumentation sites. But particularly with imprecise call graphs, you can end up with a I, 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 I don't. I don't. I actually don't know too much more than what I've just presented uh, in terms of the other details, to be honest. Okay. I, actually, I do know that they have one thing. They, they, they also address the problem of, of, of uh, getting the call trace for executions that crash in the middle. So, so if, you wanna, if, if you have a crash point, what they do is they make use of the call stack in addition to the grammar for the prefix of what they've got, because they may be missing some symbols uh, from the last log symbol up into the crash point. And so they have a way of, of filling that in as well, which is what you need if you're, if you're trying to use it for, for some kind of help with runtime debugging. Chris? The uh, Chomsky-Schützenberger theorem says that every context-free language is basically something uh, that is context free with open parentheses and closed parentheses and then throwing away the open parentheses and so on. I was thinking, is this a way of understanding what's going on? Is like uh, putting sufficiently many places into, into the, uh, uh, the call graphs so you can always see where you, uh, uh, you know, do a push um, and a pop so that it becomes LL1? That's kind of well, a fuzzy a, question. So I guess yeah. the, the original, well, I mean, the, the, the the, the, the full call trace is just the, the context-free structure of the program that you know, right. we've been using in program analysis for 20 some odd years, uh, 30 some odd years actually. And uh, the LL1, I mean, what they had, they had, there are multiple grammars that you could use to, uh, to describe that language. And they just have a particular construction that makes it LL1, right. a particularly simple construction that makes it LL1. Okay. So I don't know whether, I, I don't know whether the, uh, um, oh, I, I have the inverse of the question. It's like, why insist on LL1? I mean, uh, uh, LLK or make it already look ahead. So I, I guess an, an, uh, one of the criteria is that the inference of the full trace should be streaming in some fashion, okay? So I can see why that would be a reason. But why not uh, make it even more sparse and, uh, you know, LLK or yeah. LL star? Right. Well, I, I think, uh, I think they're, they were open to that. Uh, the, uh, they do mention LLK at, at some point in the paper. Um, but, I mean, basically it's, it's that, I mean, the general principle of which they have one manifestation is parse the sparse trace and have a concordance between the productions of the sparse trace and, the, and productions that will allow you to fill in all the symbols. And as long as you have that matching between the structure of those two trees, you get the, the reconstruction for free, essentially. Do you know how they picked the instrumentation sites in the DeCapo benchmarks? Like where they put their instrumentation? Uh, uh, well, it's where their algorithm says to do the Okay, they ran the algorithm. I, I don't know any further details. Okay, I was wondering if it was manual or if they ran an algorithm. If, they, okay. if, it, was if it was manual or if they ran an algorithm. No, no, they ran an algorithm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I believe it's an automated method, fully automated method. I mean, they're dealing with, if you look at the, the numbers, they're dealing with, Yeah, so, it was big. 
But they had a lot of authors, so I thought they could have done it manually too. <laughs> uh, I mean, they're, 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 they're logging, you know, even in their technique, they're logging an average of 10,000, over 10,000 sites per program. So they're not doing that manually, I don't think. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much.